y'all. I just recorded this entire video. This is my second time through doing this because the first time it ended up being on slow-mo. And I was like, why is it an hour and a half long? Why is it taking so long to download? <sighs> Let me try. Take two. <laughs> okay, so you have a rotation coming up in the ICU. You may or may not be a little bit nervous, a little bit worried about what they're gonna ask you. Um, I get that. I was I was there. I worked in the ICU for almost 10 years and I was still there, so <laughs> I get it. I got an email request from Karen asking me to compile a video about what people can do in advance to get ready for their ICU rotations. So that's what we're going to talk about today. There are things you can do well in advance as far as gathering your resources and what resources I think you need to bring with you, as well as what to bring with you during your rotation, as well as two things that you can do in advance to practice to make things a little easier for yourself. If we haven't met yet, my name's Bree. I'm a nurse practitioner. I make content for nurses, MPs, and students. Welcome to the channel. <sighs> Growing pains. The resources you need to have. Okay, a lot of what I'm going to tell you in this video is going to be referring to previous videos that I've made because I've talked about these things in various different ones. So when I refer to a video, I'm going to put a link up above um, so that you can quickly flip over to that. In the description below, I'll have all the references and all the videos I'm talking about. Um, because I don't want to go into like super duper detail. I just want to tell you the overall things I think you should do. And then you can refer back to those specific videos in the areas where you think you need help. So resources that I think you need to have coming in. Um, I would definitely, definitely purchase a subscription to up to date. Um, a lot of places like the place where I worked paid for it and some of the school programs will pay for it. I don't think membership is very expensive. Um, look into it because it is well worth the investment. I think its beauty is in how user friendly it is. It is super quick and easy to just type in a medication or a diagnosis and it goes straight to that from like epidemiology and prevalence to how you make the diagnosis and what tests you need to do, um, what management and treatment options are there. It goes all the way down through pretty much everything. And you can rest assured that this is evidence that is compiled through systematic reviews and it is constantly up to date. <laughs> so it is the quickest and easiest way to get to evidence-based research and guidelines. Number two is gonna be a two-part, um, well, for me, it's a twofer. <laughs> Um, medical calculation apps. And I have two different ones because each of them have different things. Like why they don't all have all of them, I don't know. But there are a lot of things, particularly in the ICU, really in any kind of inpatient care, I guess in any part of medicine, where you're gonna have to use calculations. And if you don't have these memorized, or you're not super quick with your math, these are very, very helpful. I use them for all kinds of things, like calculating a meld sodium or a matteries discriminant function, or lights criteria, or a free water deficit, or a phena, I mean, like multiple things you are gonna to have to do. These are numbers that are gonna be relevant to helping you prove your diagnosis. These are pertinence that you'll put in your note and lend credence to why you're making the diagnosis. So you want to have some medical calculators on your phone. Hippocrates, okay. Hippocrates to me is very, very useful for the outpatient clinician or for someone who's going to be writing a lot of prescriptions. I really don't use it so much in the ICU setting, but when I was a student, I used it a heck of a lot in all the different rotations I went through. I find it very, very useful for quickly getting to medications, um, recommendations for prescriptions, doses, and all of the things around that. So I like Hippocrates for that. My palliative care friend told me about this app. It's just called Opioids. I don't know, nothing super clever about that, but it is an opioid equivalent conversion table. So if you want to convert, you know, Dilaudid to morphine and back to, it just helps you put in this dose will equate to this much. So I think that can be very helpful for rotations where you're going to be doing palliation or pain management. I think that can be very helpful for that. You should also spend some time going to the professional medical organization, the societies who guide management for specific things. Okay, that was super vague, wasn't it? <laughs> what I mean by that are things like your Infectious Diseases Society of America. Um, I, they have the best resources, y'all. Their website and they have apps and they have a podcast are some of the most helpful um, you know, particularly in ICU, you're gonna be dealing with a heck of a lot of sepsis. 
So the more of a handle you have on how to make a diagnosis, what you need to do to get to a diagnosis, because sepsis is all about identifying what the source is. You've got to get to the source. How do you find the source? Once you find the source, um, how do you manage it? What antibiotics do you choose for it? And they are constantly updated by panels of experts who are looking at the systematic reviews. SCCM. Mm. If you're going into critical care, you need to get very well acquainted with the Society of Critical Care and Medicine. This is our primary medical organization. They have a very robust website with lots of training and education. They offer yearly conferences. I mean, it is just the, it is the latest and greatest as far as critical care guidelines go. Um, on that website, search for something called VCCR. It stands for Virtual virtual critical care rounds. <laughs> that was a little tricky there. Um, this is a program. It's a set of self-guided modules that teaches the novice basically all the things that you would discuss in rounds in the ICU. And it's targeted for novice folks, for people who are brand new to ICU. So I went through this program when I was in school. My school paid for it. But even if your school doesn't pay for it, I think you can do it for like 60 or $65, y'all. It is well, well worth the investment. You're going to learn so much from it. It starts from that, you know, baseline foundation level of this is how we manage this and this is what we need to assess and, and works its way up. So I think it's a very, very good place to start. And SCCM has a podcast. Definitely check out those podcasts. They're easy to search through because you can go straight to the topic that you want to learn about that day. So say we were in clinicals and we were talking about um, liver failure. You can search liver failure on the podcast and find specific discussions about that. So I highly recommend SCCM. Go check them out. In regards to studying in advance of your ICU rotation, um, there are, I mean, there are a lot of things we encounter in the ICU, but there are some things that you're going to encounter in pretty much everybody in the ICU, regardless of what ICU specialty you're going into. Okay. When you're going into CCU or neuro ICU, any of the subspecialties, you're kind of going to encounter these problems. So these are just the, the main ones that I would just review. You're not going to have a ton of time. I know you've got a lot going on. You've got <laughs> projects and stupid voice thread posts and all, all these, you know, asinine things you have to do when you're in school. But if you have time to study this in advance, it's going to help you out. You're going to come across as someone who understands a little bit more and clearly as someone who has invested in you know, preparing themselves for the rotation they're about to do. And people notice these things. So topics that I would, and here's what I would do. I would study how you need to make the diagnosis, what the treatment is, and how you write a note for these problems. Okay. First and foremost being uh, the sepsis. Everybody and I see you got those sepsis. <laughs> that is our bread and butter. So you need to know sepsis pretty darn well. Um, if you study nothing else, study sepsis. Okay. Again, go back to that IDSA that I was telling you about before. The thing about sepsis is you have to identify the source. So look into sources of sepsis in the ICU, pneumonia, UTI, bacteremia, endocarditis, osteomyelitis, anything in the abdomen. And there's a lot that goes on in here. So it's sort of hard to filter it out, but you know, cholecystitis, um, abscesses in the gut, um, bowel inflammation, C. diff, uh, toxic megacolon, um, SBP. So all of these are potential abdominal sources of sepsis. Know how you would get to a diagnosis there and what you would, what tests you would need to do and what you need to do to treat them. Second topic is going to be acute respiratory failure. And pretty much everybody you're going to see is going to have this as one of their problems, whether it's hypoxemic or hypercarbic or just ineffective airway from someone who's like an overdose. Um, you're going to have airway issues of some type in your ICU patient. So look into the things that commonly cause this pneumonia, COVID, heart failure, COPD, um, any of the ineffective airway things that um, compromise your airway, like aspiration, like overdose, um, like a stroke, like metabolic acidosis, hemodynamic compromise, all of these things affect the airway. So look into those things. I'm going to put a link up here to a ventilator series that I did. I think I did four videos on assessing and managing your ventilated patient in the ICU. I think those are very helpful. Obviously, that's why I shared them, <laughs> but go check those out. Third, shock. 
Okay, most people are hemodynamically unstable in some way, shape, or form. Not everybody, but a lot of them. So you need to look into shock, how you differentiate between the different types of shock. You're hypovolemic, you're septic, you're cardiogenic, you're obstructive, PEs, things like that. Know how you decide what type of shock they're in and what you need to do to treat it. On that note, look into things like a lactate and a procalcitonin and what those labs mean and when you need to follow them. Also look at your pressors, um, kind of have a baseline idea of which pressors are used in which indication um, and volume. Okay, this is gonna lead me to my fourth and last thing that I would say study in advance and that is volume assessment. Every single person that we round on, every single person that we admit, we need to know what their volume status is. It's all about the volume. Oh my gosh, it's really pretty obnoxious. And I'm not gonna go into the details here because that's beyond the scope of this video. But I am working on a TikTok for that. So go check that out if you're on that platform. Because um, a lot of people have asked me about how to assess volume. And it's, it's basically a lot of different things, clinical indicators, measures of static, um, volume and dynamic measures of volume too. It, it, it's a lot. So look into that, how you figure out whether your patient is wet or dry and whether or not they're volume responsive. Okay, moving into the next phase where I tell you what you need to bring to clinicals. All right, this is a little bit clickbaity because here's the truth. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm not going to judge you as a preceptor if you show up with 90 million pieces of paper and colored pens and your stethoscope ready to go and your jug of water and your cute nurse bag. Like, I've had a couple people ask me to make what's in my nurse bag video and honestly I haven't done it because I carry, I carry way too much stuff. I, I am a stuff person. But does it make me a better clinician? Not necessarily. Um, it's just things that make me feel comfortable when I'm at work and a lot of it is just paperwork different things that I carry for that. But it doesn't matter. I don't care. I don't even care if you're the kind of student who shows up and forgot their stethoscope. It don't matter. We have yellow isolation stethoscopes all over the place. It don't matter. What I need you to bring is you. I need you to bring yourself and your A-game. I need you to be there on time. I need you to be there engaged, thinking about what we're learning, researching what I'm teaching you, and focused on what we're doing. I just need you. I need your presence. I need your mind and body present the clinicals, that's it. Rest of it, whatever you wanna bring is fine. The two bonus things you can do in advance. The two things you can do, and I do advise you to practice these things because the more you practice them, the more comfortable you will be doing them in real life. One of which is presenting a patient. So, okay, I'm gonna include a link up in here somewhere as well where I, I think I have two videos. Yes, I have two videos. I have one video that is me and Nurse Sophia demonstrating the difference between presenting as a nurse and presenting as an APP and how it varies. Watch that one. The second one is how to work up and present a patient to your attending. Watch that one. Um, this one walks you through the overall big picture that you need to present. Here's the thing. Um, all things in management of an ICU patient boil back down to three key factors. Do you know what the presenting complaint, like what's the chief complaint, what they come in for, what's the problem? So what's the diagnosis and the current problems that you're facing that day and what are you gonna do about them? And that's it. And everything we do from, you know, making the diagnosis to making a treatment plan to getting that patient better or moving them on all involves knowing these key things. And that filters over into your note writing. So the way you present should mirror the way you write notes and it should be a strong understanding of these three factors. So practice presenting a patient out loud to your family, to your dog, to the walls. It doesn't matter, just say it out loud. Practice presenting a, an established patient, somebody that we're rounding on and, and your progress note type of actions for the day. And then practice a new admit because those presentations are, are kind of different. So spend some time practicing and it'll feel less intimidating when you have to do it in clinicals. The second thing is practice writing your notes. Okay, the very first ICU note that I wrote, um, <laughs> I, was, I had to write all my own paper. We didn't have access to the computer, so I wrote it out on paper. And I just remember being like super overwhelmed like, with like all these things and I couldn't, I couldn't simulate, I couldn't bring all the information in and synthesize it into what the problems were. It just felt overwhelming. And so I, I worked for hours on this note. <laughs> I gave it to my preceptor with three problems on it. And she was like, okay, Brianna, 
we're in an ICU and they have a lot more than just these three problems. Go back and try again. Um, <laughs> I just, I share that so that you know that I was intimidated by note writing too. It's kind of a lot because it's where you synthesize information and it's hard to do that when you're a novice. So the more you practice it, the more you get used to what the common problems are in an ICU note, the less intimidating it is. So shameless plug, but I highly advise you get my book. I have an, a digital book and I have a physical book that I will mail to you that is called the Ultimate H&P Cheat Sheet. And it's the list of the 12 most common ICU problems. And it's the template that I use in my hospital's EMR. And it's also a description of that template, like why we, why we order, what we're looking for on this chest x-ray, why we ordered this particular lab test for this problem. So it's a little bit of a behind the scenes on what I teach my students. This is the book that I really, really wanted when I was a student and when I was a novice. So um, it's a shameless plug, but I do think it's very, very helpful. If not that, go just spend some time researching common ICU problems and how to write a note on that. And that is it, my friends. That is it. Um, I have a lot of videos that you can reference that will help you from the note writing to the workup to the presentation. And just know that as preceptors, we have been exactly where you are. We know the intimidation factor. We know the overwhelm you're going through right now. We know how much your brain hurts at the end of the day. We get it. We do. So try not to let your brain get ahead of yourself with your anxiety in this and spend some time preparing and you will feel a little bit better and more confident going in there. Good luck, welcome to the ICU, it is the best y'all. You're gonna love ICU. <laughs>